Welcome to podcast episode 34 with my guest, uh, Wayne Neon. Hi, Wayne. How you doing? Good. I'm good. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Oh, I'm uh, happy to be here. Awesome. I'm a little shreddy right now. It's uh, very shreddy outside. It's a warm day. Yeah. So I race back. It's uh, going to get warmer before it gets cooler. It is. It is. And then it it's going to get very wet, apparently. Oh, well. Yes. Well, that is our July here in Trana. Tran, Ontario. Mm-hmm. Um, so we got Wayne Neon here. Wayne's been playing music for how long? Oh lordy. Um, let's see. Uh, I started the bleep, uh, not counting the piano lessons I took when I was eight. Uh, been playing. Well, I took up the flute in grade nine, and that was in 1961. Oh, my goodness. So <laughs> <laughs> long time. Which is odd because I'm only 37 years old. So you know. You know that 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 uh, that movie. What's that movie with the oh, car? The one where the, the uh, car guy ages backwards. Uh, oh, that's uh, Benjamin Button. Benjamin yeah. Button. Yeah. I was gonna say that uh, the one with the car and the and the Marty McFly dude. And oh the, yeah, yeah. Back to the Future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was there. Yeah. <laughs> Were you the one that was chasing them for the plutonium? <laughs> <That's right. Yeah. laughs> Where there there were. They were Libyan terrorists, I think. Some kind of terrorists. Yeah, because yeah. he was like, look out! And then they like these terrorists come and they're like, start speaking some Middle Eastern language or something. Uh-huh. And they're like, we need the bomb! <laughs> I guess they were trying to make a nuke out of it. Or I, it was, maybe it was a WMD. Right. Maybe they were Iraqi and they were trying to get their hands on the WMDs that George Bush told us all about later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so, yeah... Uh, Wayne and I have been playing together for eight years. I think it's coming up now. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Time, time means nothing to me. Time means nothing. <clears throat> so funny thing, um, uh, we used to play at this place called Not My Dog, mm-hmm. which is, you know, it's pretty, uh, it was a popular place in Parkdale. Yeah. And a lot of folks came to, uh, you know, uh, show their uh, new uh, experience. Uh, People kind of experimented there a lot, really. Uh, Great little hole in the wall dive. Not much. Literally bigger. a hole in not the wall. Not much bigger than my kitchen. Uh, no. You know. It was probably the size of this upper floor, yeah. like you know. Yeah. Always packed. Yeah. When I was there. And it was always fun. And so uh, I was looking specifically for flute for my album, and I came in and I heard you playing. So we talked and we chatted. And then I said, you know, can you come back to my place and record? And you came back to my place and we started talking. And we found out that your son and me were friends in public school. Yep. In Toronto here. In uh, Hawthorne. Yeah. And then so I told my mom and she's like, oh, yeah, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, so she pulls the picture out of my birthday. Yeah. And it was uh, Jed and myself and and a few friends acting goofy and uh and you're like yeah that's that's my jed uh-huh. <laughs> and uh yeah that's it's just kind of i find it funny how like you're you always have this intention going to not my dog to maybe not fully intention to find somebody but you end up that's where i found a lot of my connections through music was not my dog like hmm. through there it was like you know i met narani there I met a few other uh, people that I have long friendships with, you know, and it's like, uh, I felt like that was the best place in Toronto or one of the best places in Toronto where you can just be, you can try anything yeah. and nobody would say a, a word. It was a great little open mic on, I think, Wednesday nights. So. Yeah, and it was very, yeah, encur- everybody's very encouraging of each other to, to try different things. and um, So open mic thing in Toronto, like... Um, how like what what's where did it really start in Toronto? Like I know a bit of the history in in Kensington and a little bit, but like when did the open mic scene really started catching ground in Toronto? I have no idea. You know? I'm not a guy who's. I'm usually the last guy to learn about things yeah. and don't really find out. I started uh, um, ten years ago. I uh, lost my job for the last time and uh, became an. Eth- sort of officially retired person and I said well I guess uh, I guess I'm now a full-time uh, rock and roll superstar so <laughs> let's go out and make some music 
so uh, how do you do this thing? So I started going to open mics. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just, I went to places like the Free Times Cafe and uh, the Transac and uh, Grossman's Tavern and uh, Not My Dog and just checked out all the open mics I could find and made a lo lot of good friends, a lot of people who are great friends of mine now. Uh, that's most of my social life is people I make music with. Ditto. <laughs> yeah, and... Um... It's funny you mentioned uh, Grossman's too, because that's the only one I really go to anymore. The when you had yeah. last week, but you you introduced me, you brought me to that one, mm -hmm. and that was at the same time. Like I started doing open mics about ten years ago, and I started kind of in Parkdale there, and then when I moved downtown, I was very uh, close to Kensington, so I was able to get a lot of the more central ones. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, the, the Grossman's really expanded me because that was the first time I could really play with a band that was already tight. Like you, like the other places you could throw people together and it's just like, yeah, we could try something. But you guys had like a tight set band already. And then yeah. it was just like, jump in. And uh, I really uh, enjoyed it because it was like, it was allowing me to try my new songs and also just like... Uh, you know, this is the place to screw it up. You know what I mean? Like, this is the place to, you know, the audience might necessarily know that you're screwing up. But <laughs> you're just, like, trying new things and just, like, you know. Yeah, the background is uh, I host this uh, open mic and jam session on the fourth Thursday of every month at Grossman's Tavern. And uh, I sort of inherited this. Uh, it was already gone for a few years before I even went there. And uh, the people who've started it moved out to nova scotia and somebody else took it over diane baker mason and uh and then the pandemic happened and everything shut down for a while and then diane came to me and said we, we want to get this thing going uh, can you uh, co-host and uh and uh, now diane's more or less retired from it too although she shows up once in a while and uh hauls out her ukulele but uh, uh so nick levon and i host this thing uh every month and uh the we have this amazing backup band which is basically my band which used to play as wayne neon and the amazing tubular orchestra uh and it's there's like eight of us and uh these are all my best friends they're all wonderful musicians and i always say if you want to play in my band you have to be able to play a song you've never heard before mm. and they all can yeah so, yeah uh, and when you come up we just say i just tell them give me a groove and uh, away we go. Yeah, and it's fun. It's like really fun to to uh, you know just uh, get in the pocket with a band. And and the thing about rap is like a lot of I don't I like I don't want to speak for myself, but a lot of rappers that like they get comfortable. You know what I mean? Like they learn a song, and it's like I'm just gonna stick with these songs I'm performing. So these are you know safe. You know, yeah. and a lot of them go by the tracks because it's very like the rhythm of that is pretty easy to keep up with i find with a band there's like there's a lot of changes and things might not go according to plan for you so it's like it's up to you as the mc to adapt and to adjust on the fly so i feel like i got so much more uh extra experience out of that than just doing the same songs over again uh you know with the tracks and stuff like that and then with doing all that hard stuff it just makes the the memorized stuff so much easier mm -hmm. like so um if you allow yourself to kind of to to explore and to like mess up it's like it almost is like there's no safe zone anymore mm -hmm. and i heard a, a a quote from david bowie which was really cool he said you always want to be in the deep end yeah he's always like you always always want to be like feeling for the the bottom or something you know what i mean like if you're touching the bottom like it's just a like, you know comparison right so it's just he's saying like you you don't want to be safe you got to be a little scared mm -hmm. like so that's like getting up on stage trying a new song you know is it gonna work out i'm gonna fuck up people are gonna walk out and so i've never with that that like i've never been like i was 
kind of getting into that, but that gave me the full confidence of like, okay, it doesn't matter what happens. You know what I mean? I'm happy at least to throw myself out there and try. And then, uh, you know, I've had it in my early stages of like, you're just trying to work a song out and you don't have it yet. <clears throat> and I remember when I first started to do Stay Focused, I didn't know the lyrics. So I had a whole group of, it was at Tennessee in uh, Parkdale there. Yeah. Uh, so there's like 20 people at a table and they just knew I didn't have the confidence to do it. So I just like started doing it for 30 seconds and they looked at me and the one guy just shook his head. He's <laughs> like, no, and they just all got up and left. And it's like, you got to hold it down and like still do it. And you're like, you can't be like, please come back. <laughs> you, well, you can fail. Yeah. You and then the you. host, he, I don't know, uh, if he was trying to be helpful or not, but he he came up to me and he was like, "Don't worry, I'll get him next time." And I don't know if it was like condescending or like, or if he was actually being genuine or something. Yeah. But it was just like I've done this before. I'm just trying new stuff. You know yeah, what yeah. I mean? It's like I could go up there and do the songs that I know comfortably, but I'm w willing to risk this and go up. I'm willing to risk people walking away. Yeah to expand and to try new right so i'm getting back to that now so when you and i go up uh this weekend i have a few new songs we can just throw out there sure and try it um yeah so um well one you, of the things i like to say is that uh, the reason i'm a musician and not a brain surgeon is if you know i forget the words to a song nobody dies yeah <laughs> and i figured this out a long time ago and i figured out that uh the audience doesn't actually have as sophisticated an understanding of music as you do. And if you make a mistake, they don't know. They have no they idea. Have no clue. All they know is it feels good. It's, it's got a good beat yeah. and they can dance to it. So what the heck? Exactly. And if it, you know, trips up once in a while, it's in, in your head really more yeah. than the audience. It's, uh, um, and it's every, that's the thing. That's the thing about music is acquired taste, right? It doesn't. Yeah. It might not appeal to every single person in the audience, but there might be one person that's like, hey, I'm really jiving to this. This is like, um, yeah. And it also taught me to, you know, uh, when, like, because we have good audiences for that, but it also taught me to be like, To have these, not have expectations of people to kind of like enjoy it, but also to people like you might be shocked by, you might not get a great response. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it's like people might be like, oh, that's kind of different, you know? And it's never been like that at Grossman's. It's always mm -hmm. been open-minded and, and like people are, are really uh, enthusiastic about like different styles of music there. But <clears throat> it, like, you know, just with the style that I'm doing, it's like well, a lot of the small towns you go to, people are just like, what is this? Yeah, yeah. Like, this is like, and they, they're almost like, they're not being rude. They just don't know how to react to it. They're like, do I want to be the one that starts <laughs> clapping? Do I want to single myself out to, uh, uh, nobody's clapping. Okay, <laughs> I'm just going to sit quiet. Well, what can I tell you? Some people are kind of rigid in uh, what their idea is of what they like. And yeah. not everybody's open to a new thing that they haven't heard before. Yeah, but, exactly. But also, I was, I was kind of shocked to realize a little while ago it was like the 50th anniversary of hip-hop. Yeah. Well, it's been around for a while. And That's, it's getting so it's like everywhere. I'm pretty much as old as hip-hop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, well, it's, it's, it's the biggest genre in the world. It's yeah. the most popular genre. It's bled into every other genre. You look at, well, pop, country. Yeah. Everything has an element of hip-hop in it. And mm -hmm. even like, you know, even R&B sing, like other people from under other genres, they're bringing in like a rapper. Like Taylor Swift yeah. has to have a featured rapper once in a mm -hmm. while. You know what I mean? Rappers can hold it on their own. Like they can stick within their own genre. It's like almost everybody else is pulling from rappers and and it's like <clears throat> but it's weird it's a weird contrast because i wanted to get into this is because in canada it's like yes we're very we're kind of we're open-minded but it's like not really 
You know what I mean? Mm. Like we're kind of used to, you know, folk music, country, rock specific things. When it comes to rap, it's like, uh, I get this people are like, Oh, I don't usually listen to rap. And cause it's not, it's not as prevalent outside of the cities. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, whereas in the States it's like deep rooted, like it's part of the hish, like hip hop is really part of music history in the United States. It is a yeah. little in Canada too, but it uh, does. Well, hip hop has deep roots in Canada for sure. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. But it's not, I don't think it's, as knowledgeable to the general music lover in Canada as it is to the average music lover. I watched, I watched some of the uh, Canada Day celebrations on the TV show yeah. from Ottawa, and the best thing on the show was Maestro, Maestro Fresh West. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. He's been around a long time. He's, he's probably as old as hip-hop. Yeah, his, yeah. his hit, hit came out in the 80s. And uh, yeah, he was our, like, right away off the bat, Canada's got something. And, yeah. and after him, there was really nothing from as far as like hip hop. Like there was a lot of contribution, but there like nobody globally hit the way that Maestro hit. Yeah. And then you had a long gap, and then you get, you know, Cardinal had a lot of uh, international success, and then you had uh, Chaos, which was probably my favorite rapper, uh, very underrated rapper. I like Chaos. Chaos is amazing. And then Chaos kind of opened the door for Drake as well. And Drake mm. Drake is just like, he's on another level uh, for hip hop in Canada. Um, I feel it's still not sh as strong as represented as it should be. But it's still like, it's still got a long way to come in Canada. Um, you know, like even the Junos, they kind of recognize it, but it's not as like, mm. it's like we said, it's the biggest genre in the world and it's still not recognized that as that in Canada mm -hmm. it's uh but that's why I like uh, taking my stuff to small towns and and bringing you along because it's like people are like what the heck is this stuff like when we went to uh got we went to Godrich last year yes and it's just one of those venues where it's like one of the only two places to go to at night and everybody was packed. It was there. It was busy. Well, this is it. The bar owner saying, what the hell is this shit? But meanwhile, the room is full of young people dancing and having a good time. They had a great time. And, and that's drinking like, beer. What do you problem? What's your problem? Who cares? That's, that's <laughs> what you want. The yeah. end result. What, what do you care? What, uh, exactly. It was, well, he wasn't too happy because I told him we were bringing the band up, but you and, you and I are the band. <laughs> That one lady was pretty upset that there was no band, but sometimes it's just aesthetics for people. Honestly, yeah. like do they see a, a full band and they're like, "Okay, this is I can something I can accept, I can get." But then they see, you know, somebody just rapping and they're like, it makes them a little uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. So bringing you along is a lot more easing to the, to the old general audience watching well, us. Our timing was perfect on that too, because it was uh, it was homecoming weekend, right? Yes. So all yes. the all the young people who escaped Godrich to go to college were all back. Yes. For the, the weekend the and ready to party. Yeah. 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 Um. So you've traveled. Give me a little bit about your past. Like, so you had a job while you had a job. Were you in, you were in bands or were you? Oh, I've been making music for a long time. My employment history is very patchy. Uh, I was uh, done a bunch of truck driving and stuff. I'd done carpentry and contracting. I was in the sign business for 20 years, which is how I got to be Wayne Neon. Mm. Wayne Neon. Wayne Neon was the name of my sign company. Gotcha. And then uh, now it's my alter ego. Uh, and um, and I was in the actually in the air conditioning business for about 20 years too. So I've done a little bit of this and a little bit nice. of that, but I've always sort of made music. Uh, I mean, I was really into mu music was the only thing that got me through high school, uh, playing, not only playing in the high school bands, but in, uh, uh, some of us, uh, started a, a big band, you know, uh, a big swing band, 17 piece swing band, mm. which was not, not a school band. It was, uh, we were all in high school, but we just did it. And eventually I ended up as the leader of that band. So, you know, uh, 
And uh, so then I sort of stopped making music for once I got out of college for a while, once I got to university. But then when I came to Toronto and went to college, I made friends with uh, people who were into jazz and stuff and uh, uh, got dragged out to places like the Colonial Tavern where I'm mm. listening to people like Miles Davis and, uh, um, and, and so on. So, uh, and uh, then I had a, an experience where uh, one of my very first girlfriends uh, for my like 20th birthday, she, uh, she took my flute out and had it overhauled and rebuilt and gave it Ooh. to me for my birthday. So wow. that, then I had to start making music again. So that got me definitely back into making music. Um, um, and I got, uh, I had a thing where my mother, because I grew up in Norfolk County, Simcoe, Ontario. Okay, yeah, yeah. Lake Erie, right? Yeah. And uh, my mother lets me know there's a band look here in Norfolk County. They're looking for a saxophone player. Oh, okay. So I go down there and start playing with this Belgian polka band out of La Salette, Ontario, and end up moving back down there and living down there for a few years, buying a house, uh, having some kids, and, uh, and playing weddings every Saturday night for... Uh, a number of years in a polka band well I say it was a polka band because we certainly did polkas we do a whole set yeah we do like a dozen polkas in an evening yeah and waltzes and stuff but we do a set of that old-timey music we do a, a we, we'd start with a set of schmaltzy music we do a set of country and western we do a set of uh, what you call classic rock sorry let's schmaltzy well waltzes and waltzes okay yeah okay. Oh, gotcha and uh, and we do set of country and western and we do a set of uh, classic rock and yeah. so on so we because we were playing weddings you got to play a little something for everybody yeah, right yeah, yeah and uh and we were a pretty good band uh, i mean walter Ostenek was definitely the world's champion at the polkas but we reckoned we were number two in southwestern ontario and we played we literally played every saturday night and a handful of fridays every night nice so and you toured around with those guys and yeah, we well we played all the way from like uh, from Jarvis, Ontario, which is I mean once you get too close to St. Catharines, now you're into Walter's territory. Yeah, see, yeah, but yeah. everything on the everything west of that over to Sarnia uh, was a, was our territory. A lot of right? territory. <laughs> yeah, um, and we mostly played for uh, tobacco farmers' daughters' weddings. Ooh, there were a lot of tobacco farmers in those days. I bet. And a month after I joined the band, we went into the studio and cut it and made a vinyl LP, mm. which is what you what there was to make in those days. Yeah, we eagerly awaited the record, and once we got it, uh, we listened to it, and everybody said, "Oh!" and went out and had their instrument rebuilt. Is that what we sound like? Okay. <laughs> um, but we said we thought, well, we, we got a thousand. We said once we sell these thousand, the whole thing's paid for. The next thousand is gravy. Yeah, and sure enough, they went like hot cakes until we'd sold about 300 of them. And that's when we sort of realized we were actually playing to the same 300 people every Saturday night. It was just a different person's turn to get married, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but that album, there's a radio station in Tilsonburg that used to, they had a polka hour on Sunday afternoon, so they used to play our record. Is so Tilsonburg that, up by Meaford there? Uh, there? No, it's farther south. It's uh, it's close to uh, it's close to Lake Erie. It's just a little oh far, yeah, my down bad. Yeah, lake. yeah, yeah. In the heart of tobacco country, nice. my back still aches when I hear that word. <laughs> <laughs> what town in Norfolk? Uh, Simcoe, Ontario. Oh, Simcoe. So my uncle, yeah. uh, my uncle, he used to teach at Harris. He has a studio in Simcoe. Yeah. He bought this old Masonic building. Uh huh. And uh, he's. Uh, it's, it's like basement, main floor. Uh, he's got a lot of gear there. The, the Masonic Hall in Simcoe, I know it well, yes. Yeah, is uh, what's his Velvet Studios. Yeah. Uh, or I might have changed the name of that. Anyways, he's got a uh, Floyd band and a, a Doors band, a bunch of tribute bands. So uh, when I went to college, I went to for radio and television broadcasting. Yeah. So... Everybody's getting their internship, and I'm like, I don't want to go to fucking Tia Center or any of these places and be like a coffee runner. And like, I don't want to do that fucking shit. Like, I do want to work in television, but it's like, actually, I didn't have a thought of working in television yet. 
I was like, we were focused on making music, actually. We made, this is why I started making music in college. Yeah. So we made it like on, we still had uh, carts. And so we did everything on, we were the first year of digital. So we were the crossover kids. So we were the last analog and the first digital kids. So we were the very first program to learn on digital audio programs. Like uh, we used a Acid and Saw. So basically we would rip uh, like instrumental part of uh, like the end of a song and then put it on a cart and loop it mm -hmm. for like a minute and 30. And then we put it back onto the computer and, and times it by three so that you have like four minutes. And then the, all the, the, the old pods were there with the mic and it, my buddy Ben would do the, the rapping in the little booth. So we had all these like, it was like this, like a row of rooms. So we'd go in and sign out all the booths all night. <laughs> so I'd be work, I'd be mixing one song in one of them and he'd be rapping in the other one. And then we'd have a guitar guy ready going on the, like we got like really into production. So we really, really used the school for like its value. And uh, yeah, really learned how to use the old stuff before I started getting into digital. And like, uh, we actually spliced uh, tape to reel to reel. Yeah, we been learned, there, done that. We learned uh, to do that. And we're like, I'm glad we're not doing this anymore. <laughs> this is fucking tedious. And uh, you don't know what you're gonna get, right? Like it's, yeah, when I was at U of T, I was uh, in, involved in U of T radio. Yeah. Uh, radio Varsity. And this was before CIUT. We didn't have an FM license. We yeah. broadcast uh, uh, closed circuit yeah. on the campus. And uh, plus we were on Rogers Cable FM. Mm. Uh, Which was community back then. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. they had, And uh, plus they had something called Carrier Current. So we were actually on the... The 110 volt electrical wires in all the resonances and stuff really? like that. So you took a radio and tuned it like 580 and put it on your desk. And if you were actually in a university residence, you could hear us on your AM. Oh, radio. amazing! <laughs> so, but yeah, uh, it was all uh, quarter inch tape then, splicing it with a razor blade. Baby. Yeah, yeah. We used to uh, well after North Bay because we went to school in North Bay there, so we had our own little fame in North Bay. Yeah. And then we came to Toronto and reality hit. <laughs> like we're a little tiny, tiny fish. And uh, so we started, uh, you know, I worked at a club. I worked at Whiskey Saigon mm -hmm. down there. So I started getting our music played in, in those places. And then we had a friend of a friend who uh, had a slot at Ryerson uh, on the Saturday afternoon uh, radio station there so we would we would kind of just go hang out like there would be a bunch of us there and it would just be like it was there was no like put my song on the air it was just like kind of absorbing the, just hanging out and just mm -hmm. kind of seeing how it's done and uh i don't know if you remember a place called riley's it was right across the street from sam the record man okay right beside the pizza pizza there i don't it remember like but a two I'll floor club yeah so back even 20 years ago, there was very few places that did hip hop. Yeah. Like it was like you had to be, have a club or something. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the few places that had hip hop that wasn't like a bottle service place or like, a, you know, it was one of the places that you could actually be laid back and nobody was in really uptight. You know, there was no security, like it was an overkill with security and stuff like that. So they had like area people break dancing and they had like area people like, uh, doing graffiti and stuff like that and then they had like DJs and and uh, me and my buddy we used to do these promo shoots for them each week so they have like a major like artist come through each week and so they would do big promos for them there and this is still people were smoking yeah in there yeah, still yeah. and uh, so yeah we at an early age I kind of got into the rap scene in Toronto uh, like in my early 20s and then, uh, cause I was doing it like on a managerial point because I was working with my buddy and I was trying to get him into everywhere. And then uh, him and I didn't, we decided to stop the music together around like 25, 26. And then I picked it up like 28. So I feel like I was, 
pretty late to the game starting making my own music but i had already done since 18 to 30 producing with him so i already had like 12 years of experience wow. of making albums and so when i came to making my own album yes it was very difficult but i had already three albums i had four albums i had made previously mm. with with uh ben in the past right so yeah and then i always um can hear when i make music i can hear what it might sound like with something or like oh, I, this would be cool cool with a saxophone or a flute and then wh how i try it out is i kind of get my track and then i look for something on youtube i'm like oh sax solo or something and then i try and play it together and if it do it doesn't have to sync necessarily it just it just be like does this sax go with this yeah so that's how i kind of tested it out for you i was i had cool cats and um i was like oh this could really use a saxophone so i was like pulled up something on youtube and i was like oh this this will <laughs> totally work this is and ben the guy i was talking about he actually came up with that hook the cool cats one uh -huh. and i was i'm really meticulous about things getting recorded properly uh -huh. so i want things like I do like the magic. I like get capturing the magic, but also I like it recorded properly. So uh, he did it, but we did it at my house. Yeah. And it was the vocals were not great. Like it, the, his delivery was amazing, but just the recording was rough. Yeah. So I wanted him to come to the to the studio and redo it, and he didn't want to do it. And I was like, all right, I'm just gonna do it myself. <laughs> I just, I'm tired of waiting for people, so I'm just gonna kind of do it myself. And uh, yeah, he he was involved in this first album, and then the second album, and then the last album I pretty much did by myself. And uh, yeah, kind of going back um, to my, how I made my second album, this one coming up, it's kind of like trying to prove to myself again that I can make my own beats and produce most of it myself. And so that's where I'm, I've got like three, four songs and most of them are produced by myself. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the most writing I've ever done these four years, especially the two like lockdown years, yeah. I've filled like two books two thick books of lyrics and I had I went through all of that and basically like gave some sticky notes and then so I have like over a hundred songs typed up on the computer as PDF files so now it's just like putting the puzzle together and kind of like and well it's a do it yourself now for sure I mean the, I mean the technology you've got in this room is like completely outclassed what the Beatles had to use at oh, the leading fuck, yeah. recording studio. Oh, yeah. Day, right? Yeah. Just the mixer alone is like, yeah. Yeah. And when the, uh, I mean, when the pandemic hit, all of a sudden all gigs were canceled. Yeah. And there, uh, there I am stuck in my basement. Uh, so that's when I started to, uh, to figure out how to do this. Uh, yeah. So did that, like, that's when I want to ask you too, because a lot of uh, artists I speak to, it's like, you must be. Like you, you were a certain way before the lockdown. It must be different after the lockdown because I'm sure a lot of people got schooled on how to stream and stuff yeah. like that. You had to teach yourself. So what, like, what did you pick up out of the lockdown? Mostly? Uh, well, definitely the the streaming thing. Yeah. And I hooked up with uh, friends of mine who were doing a uh, open mic every Wednesday and open mic every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And you'd go on and we had to take turns because on Zoom you can't all play at the same time. Yeah. At least you couldn't then. I don't know if you can now. Yeah. And so uh, uh, that got me into like learning a new song every week. I probably learned a uh, hundred new songs during the, uh, during, the, during the pandemic when I was stuck in my basement. Uh, I don't think I actually wrote anything. I've got... I, I don't write a lot. I only yeah. got a half a dozen original tunes, yeah. which I'm proud with. But yeah. it's not, uh, you know, there's still uh, a million great songs I haven't learned yet out there. What does the world need a new song for me for? You yeah, know? But, there's a lot to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I was going to say about like rounding it back to the open mics. It's like, you know, you do so many and I work nights too. So it's like. I, like you said, 10 years ago, I started going and I would go everywhere 
almost yeah. every night. I was like painted lady, grossman's here or there, like a supermarket, hitting up as much as I could and on top of working nights as well. And I did it for so long and then I got to a point where I was just like, fuck, I'm burnt from doing this. Yeah. Because my job entails this as well. Mm -hmm. So it's like now I have to pick and choose which nights I really want to go out now. And uh, yeah, I just, I... It's plus you mix in drinking and it's like yeah, yeah. then you then it's like really what nights do you want to choose to do that? But the open mic thing I, I wanted to get back to was you kind of after a while I kind of started losing the edge of the fun for it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like where I find myself I was on stage and I maybe drank a little too much and then it's like okay now I'm getting sloppy. This is not cool and well, I want to pull I, this back. But what I was trying to say is that when I came, we came back at the lockdown and I went for the first time again. And it was just that pure joy and excitement of that's the only reason you're going for, you know, like it's nice to socialize and well, that's the main reason you're going for. It's like nice to socialize, nice to have a drink, but it's like, you're really going for that feeling of playing. Like you've waited all this time, yeah. you've traveled, you might have to wait three, four hours just to play two songs. Yep. But it's walking away at night with that feeling and there's nothing like it. It's like you can't explain it to people who who don't do it. And they're like, oh, why do you go and do all this stuff? It's like that little moment, that nugget <laughs> that you get to take at home with you. Yeah, yeah. That's worth it all. It's like yeah. the whole thing is worth it. Well, the, uh, open mics are wonderful things. Yeah. An open mic is like a box of chocolates. You yeah. just don't know what you're going to get. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the good thing is if what you're listening to sucks, wait five minutes and it'll be something <laughs> yeah. completely different. Yeah. But it's amazing. Every um, open mic, you're going to hear somebody who makes you go, oh, my God, well, at least I'm better than that guy. And, yeah. and every open mic, you're going to see somebody who walked in off the street, you never heard of this person, and they just blow your mind saying, holy shit, where did that guy come That's from? That's happened so freaking much. I can't quite how many times. Yeah. But it's interesting because, I mean, there are people who go to open mics and some of them have not the least concept of melody, rhythm, yeah. harmony, intonation, nothing. Yeah. They have no clue and they don't care. They just throw their head back and wail. And the, <laughs> you know, the most awkward performance is somehow incredibly compelling. Yeah. Because you know? music is not about technique. It's about emotion. It's right? all. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can get, you can tap into somebody else's emotion watching it, yeah. then that's it's worth, it's worth it, the, the connection there. Um, yeah, no, it's 100% true. And uh, it's interesting because it sets the bar for you too. Because you're like, you come in and somebody comes from nowhere and just blows it out of the water. Yeah. You're like, holy fuck, I gotta step it up. And... Uh, that's what I liked about Painted Lady the most. It's like everybody that went up was like fucking mm. killer. You're yeah. like, holy shit, I got to follow that. <laughs> and you're like, but on the other hand, you're like, it's uplifting too. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, I get to f I get to follow that. You know, it's yeah, more, yeah. I get to ride that wave that everybody's feeling. Sure. And uh, I really want to give a shout out to that, to Nelson uh, Sabral for yeah. um, that open mic. He really fucking absolutely. That's he it. That's and it. I think his standards created uh, a standards for greatness because he was like he made it fair. Yeah. It was like he got there and it's like hey, you waited the longest. You were here first, so it's like you we we get you going. And he was like strict, you know, which yeah. was great. You need to have that. And he's like. He's like, you got to be ready. You know, you're ready. If you're not ready, I'm going to the next person. Yeah, yeah. So it, it created this type of, you know, like standard. And then uh, it, there's just so many amazing musicians that stepped up there. And you're just like, holy fuck. It's just like I'm surrounded by amazing artists. And uh, when I first started going there, he, he was basically kicking it off. This is like eight years ago. And uh, th like I see it's almost like an alumni we have from that. And it's like, you've seen f maybe half a dozen artists coming out of that. Like where we also go to that open mic that are fucking mega stars now. Mm -hmm. Like our buddy, Evan, Ace and Abby, 
he's blowing the fuck up. This guy Jeremy that used to play there, all Jeremy I don't, Albino. I don't know if you know him. Yeah. He's like a megastar now, and it's like this was like. The foundation for people to grow and to really yeah. be amazing artists. And well, another uh, real high quality open mic is uh, at Noonan's on yes. Monday nights. Uh, it used to be the Dora Keo, yeah, uh, but it's basically the same open mic. And uh, and I saw Julian Taylor there a long time ago. Whoa. And Julian Taylor's on his way to superstardom. He yeah. is. He's uh, he's. Ace and Abby played with him. He's gonna win Junios and shit. You know. Yeah, we and that's the that's the beauty thing about playing, and you, you know, you know, you played a long time, and now we get we're going out of town, and the beauty thing about it is like you always meet somebody with one degree of separation yeah. that you know somebody, mm-hmm. you know, it's like oh, uh, that's my guitar player. It's like oh, I know that guy. That's like I played with him last week, yeah, and yeah. it's like you always there's always a there's a beauty a connection, and uh, I think you mentioned. Julian Taylor, I saw a post. I can't remember who it was. A friend of mine, can't remember who it, exactly what it was, but they they were playing with them, and I was like, oh, awesome! That's yeah. Like, I get the you get to cheer on so many awesome artists that you knew personally. Yeah. And it's like Toronto is such a fucking amazing uh, area for amazing musicians. It's just a really tough market, and it's just like. Not enough audience, I feel like, that goes out. But any night, you, you can go to 50 places and choose, you know, whatever you want to see. It's the audience plethora, really. It's like a smorgasbord for music lovers, you know? Well, one thing I figured out a long time ago is there's, uh, there's like 5,000 saxophone players in Toronto. Uh, and I'm better than 90% of them, Okay. But that means there's still 500 of them who are better than yeah, me. Yeah. And, still... and only 15 of them are actually making a living. Yeah, and the 15 of them are working. Yeah. So I'm not going to be a session guy in this town because on a Tuesday night, if he's not doing anything, you can probably get Pat LaBarbera for 80 bucks or something. Yeah, you know? yeah, so yeah, yeah. Forget about it. I'm, one thing I figured out is I have to be the band leader. I have to hire the musicians, not try yeah. to get hired. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I think I don't know if this is uh, plugged in properly. I think we're gonna wrap it up soon because it's getting pretty hot here. <laughs> it's getting a little warm in here. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. We we uh, I really enjoyed playing with you, and yeah. it's been fun. And we're gonna keep going. We're gonna go till there's dust mm-hmm. on the on the stage. To like they say in Spinal Tap, he, he spontaneously combusted. <laughs> Again, another drummer. <laughs> well, like Ronnie Hawkins used to say, the big time is right around the corner, boys. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I got I got to ask you, like, what's your favorite Spinal Tap? Are you do you like Spinal Tap? I love Spinal Tap. What's your favorite yes. moment from that movie? Oh, uh, there's so many. I I hard to put you. I on think the spot, when they but... when they're talking about jazz is basically for people who hate music. And... <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> forgot that part. What is that? Is that when they're interviewing them? They're or? sitting around in a dressing room being interviewed. Yeah. <laughs> my my favorite is uh, well, there's many. I have so many. It's like uh, when they're reviewing their albums, and he goes. Uh, you made the song and made the album Shark Sandwich, and there was only one review, and it was called Shit Sandwich. <laughs> and he's like, "You can't write that." It's like, it's like you can't do that. But that was the that was the same interview where they're like they're explaining what happened to all their drummers, and he's like, "Yeah, he's just spontaneously combusted." He's like, "What?" It's like, "Yeah, like a like a, a pile of dust on his his uh, stool." <laughs> and he's like, and he's like, well, the the report was, uh, he, uh, oh no, that was the other guy choked on his own vomit, <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't that like a stick at Jimmy or something? That was kind of like a Jimi Hendrix poke or something. No, but you're reminding me of the time when I was with the polka band, and the uh, the drummer had a little too much to drink, and we got to the end of the evening, and we always closed every evening by playing O Canada, yeah. believe it or not. And we played the last bars of O Canada, and the drummer just fell backwards off the stage. <laughs> I guess that's the end of that show right there. 
So what was the reaction to that? People were just oh, well, like, fortunately, the show was over. Show's so over, folks. Go the fuck home. Well, at least half the drums are packed away. It's off the stage. <laughs> Oh, I, I've, I've worked a lot of live production, so I've seen some things, uh, but... Oh, I've seen some crazy shit. Uh, yeah. Okay. I remember one time we had these... Uh, we're playing in an arena, and uh, it was like the fish fry or something, the Langton fish fry, and this, uh, and we had these column speakers standing, and some guy just, some drunk just comes up and hauls out his dink and starts pissing on the speaker, you know? Hello. <laughs> Hello. Did he get zapped at least? I don't no. Uh, no, I was. Did he finish? There was another time. Did he finish at least? <laughs> we're, we're playing a wedding at the Belgian Hall. Yeah. Legendary Belgian Hall in Delhi, Ontario. And uh, somebody had come to the wedding with her new boyfriend and yeah. is sitting at the table with her ex husband and his new girlfriend. Oh, jeez. And uh, as she's getting drunker and drunker, she's starting to go on about, now I got me a real man now, oh, blah, 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 right. blah, blah. And at some point, the, the ex-husband just, he jumps up and takes his fork and stabs the new boyfriend in the hand. Holy and shit. And everything goes for a big shit. And it was like a scene from a cowboy movie, right? Yeah. The band leader just looked at us and said, keep playing. <laughs> Stop. Well, at least he had a rhythm section to the fight. <laughs> I feel I picture just like a scene at a roadhouse or something. With the, exactly, it was, it was Jeff it, Healy just. It's a, da, da, da. It's a scene from a Blues Brothers movie. <laughs> oh man! But did you have? Have you ever had any bottles thrown at you or anything? Uh, not that I recall. No, uh, played in some roadhouses though. <laughs> All right, I think we're gonna. Wrap this up. Okay. I'm sweating my balls off here. I got yes, yes. I got a radio interview soon. Well, I got a few thousand more stories, so we'll do oh, this we'll again Oh, we'll do another time. one, yeah, when the air conditioning is a... Yeah, uh, you're an air conditioning expert. That's let's, right. Let's get this working in here. Yes, I'll give you an estimate. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's too much for me. <laughs> Anyways, thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. My thanks pleasure. For, uh, Wayne and I are playing... Uh, I'm going to be airing this today on Monday... So we're going to be playing in Halliburton mm -hmm. on July 14th mm -hmm. at the Hook, Line, and Sinker at 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. We're going to do... Sunday morning, baby. Hip-hop and Holy brunch. Crap. Yeah. This is before I get up. <laughs> yeah. This is well before musician time. This is uh, before noon. What the fuck? <laughs> Anyways, thanks, buddy. Not Appreciate to mention it. our uh, festival in Kew Gardens coming yes, up. Yes, uh, I'm mentioning it uh, slowly. I'm kind of bleeding in. August 3rd, we got a huge festival at Kew Gardens, which is uh, the gazebo. It's called the Alex Christie Gazebo at Kew Gardens. August 3rd, a Saturday. We're going to be there 1 to 9. It's a free festival for the whole family. We got... Focus in the Bad Meat Band with Wayne Neon mm -hmm. and seven other acts. It's going to be phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Rain or shine, bring your poncho, bring your blanket, bring your snacks, bring your doobables, and have a good time. And come on out, folks. Okay. Thank you for watching. Have a great day and stay focused.